It begins with a farmer supporting a family on a dozen different species of plants and animals. There would have been a fair amount of corn then too, but also fruits and other vegetables, as well as oats, hay, and alfalfa to feed the pigs, cattle, chickens, and horses. Horses being the tractors of that time. One of every four Americans lived on farms when Naylor's grandfather arrived here in Sheridan. His land and labor supplied enough food to feed his family and 12 other Americans besides. Less than a century after, fewer than two million Americans still farm, and they grow enough to feed the rest of us. What that means is that Naylor's grandson, raising nothing but corn and soybeans on a fairly typical Iowa farm, is so astoundingly productive that he is, in effect, feeding some 129 Americans. Measured in terms of output per worker, American farmers like Naylor are the most productive humans who have ever lived. Yet George Naylor is all but going broke, and he's doing better than many of his neighbors, partly because he's still driving that 1975 tractor. For though this farm might feed 129, it can no longer support the four who live on it. The Naylor farm survives by the grace of Peggy Naylor's paycheck. She works for a social services agency in Jefferson and an annual subsidy payment from Washington, D.C. Nor can the Naylor farm literally feed the Naylor family as it did in grandfather Naylor's day. George's crops are basically inedible. They're commodities that must be processed or fed to livestock before they can feed anyone. Water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. Like most of Iowa, which now imports 80% of its food, George's farm, apart from his garden, his laying hens, and his fruit trees, is basically a food desert. The 129 people who depend on George Naylor for their sustenance are all strangers, living at the far end of a food chain so long intricate and illegible that neither producer nor consumer has any reason to know the first thing about the other. Ask one of those eaters where their steak or soda comes from and she'll tell you the supermarket. Ask George Naylor whom he's growing all that corn for and he'll tell you the military industrial complex. Both are partly right. I came to George Naylor's farm as an unelected representative of the group of 129 curious to learn who and what I find at the far end of the food chain that keeps me alive. There's no way of knowing whether George Naylor is literally growing the corn that feeds the steer that becomes my steak, or that sweetened my son's soft drink, or supplied the dozen or so corn-derived ingredients from which his chicken nugget is constructed. But given the complexly ramifying fate of a bushel of commodity corn, the countless forking paths followed by its 90,000 kernels as they're dispersed across the nation's sprawling food system, the odds are good that at least one of the kernels grown on the Naylor farm has, like the proverbial Adam from Caesar's dying breath, made its way to me. And if not me, then certainly you. This Iowa cornfield, and all the others just like it, is the place most of our food comes from. Planting the City of Corn. The day I showed up was supposed to be the only dry one all week, so George and I spent most of it in the cab of his tractor, trying to get acquainted and get his last 160 acres of corn planted at the same time. A week or two later, he'd start in on the soybeans. The two crops take turns in these fields year after year, in what has been the classic corn belt rotation since the 1970s. Since that time, soybeans have become the second leg supporting the industrial food system. It, too, is fed to livestock and now finds its way into two-thirds of all processed foods. For most of the afternoon, I sat on a rough cushion George had fashioned for me from crumpled seed bags. But after a while, he let me take the wheel. Back and forth and back again, a half a mile in each direction. Planting corn feels less like planting, or even driving, than stitching an interminable cloak, or covering a page with the same sentence over and over again. The monotony, compounded by the roar of a diesel engine well past its prime, is hypnotic after a while. 
Every pass across this field, which is almost, but not quite, dead flat, represents another acre of corn planted, another 30,000 seeds tucked into one of the eight furrows being simultaneously etched into the soil by pairs of stainless steel discs. A trailing roller then closes the furrows over the seed. The seed we were planting was Pioneer Hybrids 34H31 a strain that the catalog described as an adaptable hybrid with solid agronomics and yield potential. The lack of height, notable for a seed catalog, probably reflects the fact that 34H31 does not contain the yield guard gene. The Monsanto-developed line of genetically engineered corn pioneer is currently pushing. The modified 34B98 on the same page promises outstanding yield potential. Despite the promises, Naylor, unlike many of his neighbors, doesn't plant GMOs. He has a gut distrust of the technology. They're messing with three billion years of evolution, and doesn't think it's worth the extra $75 a bag in technology fees they cost. Sure, you might get a yield bump, but whatever you make on the extra corn goes right back to cover the premium for the seed. I fail to see why I should be laundering money for Monsanto. As Naylor sees it, GMO seed is just the latest chapter in an old story. Farmers eager to increase their yields adopt the latest innovation, only to find that it's the companies selling the innovations who reap the most from the gain in the farmer's productivity. Even without the addition of trans genes for traits like insect resistance, the standard F1 hybrids nailer plants are technological marvels, capable of coaxing 180 bushels of corn from an acre of Iowa soil. One bushel holds 56 pounds of kernels, so that's slightly more than 10,000 pounds of food per acre. The field George and I planted that day would produce 1.8 million pounds of corn. Not bad for a day's work sitting down, I thought to myself that afternoon. Though, of course, there'd be several more days of work between now and the harvest in October. One way to tell the story of this farm is by following the steady upward arc in the yield of corn. Naylor has no idea how many bushels of corn per acre his grandfather could produce, but the average back in 1920 was about 20 bushels per acre roughly the same yields historically realized by Native Americans. Corn then was planted in widely spaced bunches in the checkerboard pattern so farmers could easily cultivate between the stands in either direction. Hybrid seed came on the market in the late 1930s, when his father was farming. You heard stories, George shouted over the din of the tractor. How they talked him into raising an acre or two of the new hybrid, and by God, when the old corn fell over, the hybrid stood straight up. Doubled Dad's yields till he was getting 70 to 80 an acre in the 50s. George has doubled that yet again, sometimes getting as much as 200 bushels of corn per acre. The only other domesticated species ever to have multiplied its productivity by such a factor is the Holstein cow.